So this week's video is going to go over the calculations that you need for coffee cup calorimetry. Uh, you can see the image there on the right. It kind of mimics what we did there in the lab. So for coffee cup calorimetry, we're combining two things that are going to result in an exchange of heat. And the way we know that happens is we're going to look for a change in the temperature. The heat loss plus the heat gain should be equal to zero. We know that from the first law. And the cup itself is going to absorb some heat, which means that we're going to have to calculate its calorimeter constant. And that's different for every set of cups that gets used. And there will be a lot of data to keep track of. So please be aware of that as we go into lab. So let's calculate the amount of heat lost and the heat gained in each system. So for the heat loss by the warm water, that's a simple equation. The amount of heat loss is, is equal to the mass times the specific heat of water times the change in temperature of final minus initial. So starting with this data that I've manufactured, just to give us something to work with, 50 grams of water, the specific heat of water, a final temperature of 26.87 and an initial temperature of 43 degrees, plugging it in, one of the things you'll notice is we get a negative number because our final temperature is lower than our initial temperature. That makes sense because warm water should lose heat. Now, the uh, heat gained by the cold water, again, same equation, very similar uh, numbers to work with. Although uh, we're starting with colder water, so the initial temperature is 25 degrees and it's going to end up getting warmer. So when we plug these numbers in, we get 391 joules. Now, the calorimeter constant is something we have to calculate because the heat loss and the heat gained added together should equal zero for this, but it doesn't. Those two numbers are different. So the cup is absorbing some heat. So the heat loss by the warm water plus the heat, heat gained by the cold water plus the heat gained by the cup, that equals zero. And that heat gained by the cup is what we're going to focus on now to get the calorimeter constant. So expressed as an equation, it looks about like this. And plugging these things in, negative 3370 plus 391 plus the temperature range for the water that we had in the cup, 26.87 minus 25, times C, which is standing for the calorimeter constant for the cup. All that adds up to zero. And now it's just simple mathematics. We combine like terms. We get the variable on one side. We do our division, and we get to 1590 joules per gram degree Celsius. That's Celsius. That means that for every degree Celsius change that we see in this cup, the cup will have absorbed 1,590 joules. So that's what the calorimeter constant does for us. Let's put it to use. The energy released by the reaction is what we're going to look at now. So here we have about 100 grams of water with its specific heat, and then the final temperature of 37.5 degrees and the initial temperature of 25 degrees. Again, these are numbers that have manufactured, so we have something to work with. So the amount of heat that is gained by the water plus the heat that is gained by the cup plus the heat that is lost by the reaction should add up to zero. Uh, just moving the heat that is lost to the reaction on the other side there, and that's what we're going to try to solve for. So plugging in 100 grams times its specific heat times the temperature range plus 1590 for the heat that is gained by the cup times its temperature range comes out to uh, 25,105 joules, and that's the equal to the heat lost during the reaction. Just moving that negative sign over, 25.1 kilojoules is the amount of heat lost in that reaction. And the thing for us to notice here is that because heat is being given off, it is a negative number. So for the lab, there's a lot of data to collect. The mass of warm water and cold water, the temperature of warm and cold water, the temperature of the mixture, that all helps us get the calorimeter constant. After that, you'll need the mass and temperature of sodium hydroxide and HCl and the temperature change that happens after you mix them. And then we'll do another experiment with acetic acid and sodium hydroxide and the temperature of the change that happens when they're mixed together. You'll also need plots of temperature versus time for your reactions. I'll help you with that on Excel. There's a lot to keep track of here. Go slow and go back over this tutorial so you understand the calculations that we're using. Thanks a lot. We'll see you in class.